thank you for coming in tonight. Again, my name is Bill Stead. I work for Arizona Capital Management. Uh, we're part of Satara Investors, and we are doing monthly financial wellness webinars. Last month, we did one on just overall financial wellness. I, I call it Financial Wellness 101, all the different parts of putting together good long-term financial plans. This month, we're focusing on a subject that a lot of people really don't like to talk about. It's something that we all need, everybody hates, nobody wants to spend the time on, but is probably one of the most important parts of your financial wellness, and that is budgeting. And I've got a sample budget up here. This is right off our Arizona Capital Management website, uh, which I'd like to encourage you to, to take advantage of, and I'll give you that information in a second. But before doing this webinar, we I went online to Google and I Googled budgets and and you know how it goes, 1.7 seconds, there was like 2 billion hits on budgets and budgeting. So it's a big topic. A lot of people want to know more about it. What we're going to try to do tonight is touch on it and uh, give you some ideas of how to get going on budgets and how to make them work specifically for you. So part of this program is put together by the Association of Financial Educators and along with Arizona Capital Management. My partner's name is Matthew Julian. Uh, he is not with us here tonight, so I'm handling the, the webinar. And again, this is the second in the series this year. The third one is taking place next month. And that one is on tax strategy. So right before we all have to file our taxes, uh, we're having one on tax strategies. So maybe that can to help some people last minute save some, a little bit of money on taxes. So anyhow, in terms of the budgeting, there's a couple of things that we want to make sure we learn about. One is the importance of tracking where your money goes, right? Uh, it's, it's one of those things we talk, I've been doing this for 40 years, financial planning for people. And one of the things that people often tell me is that they get to the, they run out of money before they get to the end of the month. So it's real important is the primary purpose of budgeting is to help you learn to track where your money goes. So I told you, I'd give you some details on us again, we're Arizona capital management. Uh, and, uh, we are located right down on Highland Avenue in Phoenix. You can see our phone number on there. And I think more importantly than the phone number is the web address, acm.saterrainvestors.com. Um, if you go to this website, we have many financial tools on there that are free and available for you to use, browse through, and take advantage of. There's all kinds of formulas and tax tables and budget sheets. So if you're, if you're looking for a source to get some information and don't want to go through the drudgery of getting on the internet and wading through all the ads, Go to Arizona Capital Management's website. I'm sure there's some things on there that can help you out. If you can't find what you need, you can always click on there and get a message to us and we can help you find it as well. So let's talk about our objectives for tonight. First thing we want to do is we want to learn about the facts of money. There's a couple different types of things, uh, types of money out there. And you have to know what types there are. The second thing you have to do is figure out how to where, track where your money goes. And again, uh, so many people run out of money before they get to the month because they just don't understand where it trickles away to. Next thing we're going to do is understanding your expenses. There are two primary types of expenses. There's your fixed expenses and there's your variable expenses. So we want to get into the difference between those a little bit. We want to help you distinguish your wants from your needs. We want to learn how to make a budget work for you. You might, you know, you go to work, you sit next to people, you have neighbors on each side of you in your neighborhood what sort of budget they work with might not be the right budget for you. And I think sometimes that's what really gets people turned off on the whole idea of budgeting. So figuring out how to make a budget work for your needs. And then once we understand all that, we can get started on a financial plan. So let's talk about the facts about money, right? And I guess the primary thing you want to take away from this is everybody only has a limited amount of money. It doesn't matter who you are. Even the wealthiest people out there, there is a limit to how much money they have. So obviously, if you're uh, one of the people that can take, take a spaceship to outer space, your discretionary income is a little bit different than the majority of ours out here. But what you have to understand first in terms of budgeting is that your household has a limited amount of money. The second thing you have to do is you have to understand how to prioritize what to buy now, what to buy later and what you really don't have to have at all. For example, keeping up with the Joneses, we've all heard this our whole life. Our neighbor gets a new car, and suddenly a couple of the people on the street have a new car. Somebody gets a new air conditioner, a couple of the people get new air conditioners, right? Somebody gets a new PlayStation, everybody has to have a new PlayStation. We are taught when we're younger, 
very quickly that there are some things that we are not going to get. But as we get all, got older and we had a little discretionary income, we started taking over that decision-making process. And we started deciding what we wanted to buy now, what we're going to buy later, what we're going to do with that. But when you do budgeting, it's going to help you prioritize what those are. So let's take a look at your budget, right? Uh, and why do we do that? Because your money, your money is your future. Without understanding where your money's at and where it's going, you are not going to get to your long-term goals unless you have a windfall that is unexpected. So we have to take a look at a budget and figure out where the money's at. Now, it's not as difficult as you might think. Many people kind of shy away because of the tediousness of it and the amount of work that you think it's going to be. But really, you only have to do it for a short amount of time, get a good idea of where your money's going, and then it's a lot easier to allocate the money that you have towards some of your other goals and objectives. And really, if you get a handle on your budget, reaching your goals can become a reality. And at the same time, even almost as important as that, it can help you avoid going into debt when something unexpected comes up. And that's what happens if we don't live within our budget. Unexpected things happen, and we haven't prepared ourselves to take care of those emergencies. So where do we begin when we start to talk about budgeting? Well, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take a look at what your obligations are and where you're spending your money at now, right? we got to look at them closely, too. we got to take a look at what your overhead costs are, right, and what your fixed expenses are. So, again, we touched earlier on there's two different types of expenses. There's fixed expenses and there's variable expenses. So let's talk about each of those in a little bit more detail. Let's start with fixed expenses. Now, some of these are going to be obvious to you, right? Uh, housing, that's a fixed expense, whether it's a mortgage or a rent payment, that money has to be paid every month, or you're not going to have ability to live where you're at. A lot of your utilities are fixed. And even in the city of Phoenix, I know APS and uh, your, your electric companies will offer monthly budgets. So you pay the same amount of money every month for things like your electric. Uh, your gas can be done the same way. If you have a telephone, how much is your telephone every single month? The cable bill is a fixed expense. Now, we can talk about how to make that cable bill a variable expense in a couple of minutes, but for most people out there, they want to have some sort of cable access. So that is an expense that comes in every month that has got to be paid. Your water bill has to be paid, and water and sewer come together. They have to be paid. If you have a home, that's in a homeowners association. You might have uh, an expense there that you have to keep up with. Other fixed expenses that you may not think about right away are outstanding debt payments, short-term personal loans, um, credit card payments, car payments, anything that required that you borrowed money for that requires you to pay them back until you paid off that debt. That is an, a, a fixed expense that has to be paid. If you work, if you have children and in, in order for you to work, you have to have somebody take care of them. You might have daycare expenses or tuition expenses if your children are old enough to go to college. Also in the state of Arizona, you have mandatory auto insurance. So again, these are expenses that you have got to pay each and every month, regardless of what's going on. Some people have to pay, may even have to pay transportation expenses if they're using public transportation to and from work. Those are givens. The variable expenses is where you can make up some ground in your budget. So what comes up comes under the variable expense category? Well, things like clothes. I've got two daughters. One of them is a clothes hound. The other one, we can't get to buy a new pair of clothes, and a new pair of slacks, a new blouse, a new dress, a new coat. We can't get her to spend money on any of it, right? So clothes is a variable expense. People have different feelings about how much money they should be spending towards their clothes. Food. Especially now, this is an area that you really have to pay close attention to. Used to be that you could go out as a couple and for $15, get a breakfast somewhere. Suddenly, that's $30 or $35 for the same breakfast that you're buying. The cost of food has gone up incredibly because of inflation right now. But food is a variable expense. You can control how much you spend on it to some extent. Your entertainment. And people entertain themselves differently. Some people like to go to clubs. Some people like to go to concerts. Some people like to go out to the, the casinos, right? Everybody has different ideas of what they want to do for entertainment. But again, that's all by choice, right? You can decrease the amount of entertainment you're doing or change where you're being entertained and control that expense some. 
And the last one I like to always bring up are gifts and celebrations. We just finished a holiday season. What everybody gets is a gift early on in the new year are all the bills from all the money they spent during the holidays, where they are on going out to dinners, traveling, buying gifts for friends and families. The costs get up quite a bit. Celebrating people's birthdays, anniversaries, whatnot. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of reasons why we feel like we need to spend money in celebrations. These are variable expenses. So we have some choices that we have to face. Are they really necessary? No, we all want to have cable TV, but do we need to have it with HBO, Showtime, Cinemax, and everything else? We all want to have internet, but do we have to have the highest streaming speed possible if we don't even play video games or watch movies online? All right, manicures, new cars, vacations, are they necessary expenses? Do we have to buy the newest iPhone? Some people are have to buy new phones now because if you have the ones that are, what, I think uh, uh, four, uh, iPhone 4, iPhone 5, uh, the uh, uh, 3G network is closing down. So some people are being forced to buy a new phone if they have them that old. But very few people do because we have been trained when new phones come out to rotate them over, right? We have been trained as a society to spend the money we make every month. So if we're used to paying... $50 a month for a phone and the new phone comes out and uh, Verizon tells us we can have that new phone for the same $50 a month, we get it. So all we've done is extended the payment periods, right? We're used to spending all the money that we have allocated for that. Things like going out to eat. Obviously, I'd love to go out to eat all the time. I had a client once, one of the first things we do, and we sit down with people who say, we need to do a budget. We need to figure out where your money's going and how much money we can take and channel towards uh, putting your child through college or buying that vacation home or getting retired. That's why we work with people. So we do a budget first. I got the budget back from this client, and they said that they usually speed out expense of over $1,500 a month. Think about that for a second, $1,500 a month. That's $18,000 a year over 10 years. That's $180,000 spent on going out to eat. Now, we aren't going to stop people from going out to eat just because we've recognized that. But maybe if we realize how much we're going out, we can cut back a little bit. We all grew up at a time when we all used to, go, all used to meet as a family for dinner. You know, the kids and the parents sat around the table. We talked about school. We talked about our days. Um, Maybe it's time to get back to that a little bit, a little some, and save some of the going out to eat money. Concert tickets, buying new boots. It snowed. I'm in Prescott today. We had eight inches of snow. Maybe I should be thinking about getting new boots. But really, in Phoenix, Arizona, how often do we need to get new boots, right? New clothes, which we talked about. All of these things are wants versus needs, right? We understood this, again, very clearly when we were growing up. We would go to our parents and we would say, we want that new bicycle, right? We want a new pair of jeans. We want that, that, that Barbie doll, right? Whatever it was, as children, you're always about wants. And the parents who are working on budget or within income need, uh, limits would always say, do we need to get that for you? You already have a bike. Do we need to get you a new bike, right? So what happens is we grow older, we start to take control of our money and we start to make our own decisions on this instead of somebody telling us. And if we understand though, the difference between wanting something, right? And needing something, the desire to have something versus the necessity of having it. If you can get a grip on that, that's really gonna help you manage your spending. So controlling your budget, means making awfully tough decisions, right? And that's why we don't want to do this. We don't want to be told what we can spend our money on and what we don't want and what we can't spend our money on. So a lot of people shy away from it. So what we try to do, Matt and I at Arizona Capital Mitch, we try to help people think differently, all right? We want you to do budget, but we want you not to have to give things up, right? Some, some examples, and people hate this. Again, love it or hate it, these are, these are the facts. A lot of people like to get that coffee on the way into work in the morning, whether it's from uh, Starbucks, which is the big one, 
but there's all kinds. There's the Dutch bros out there. There's lots of coffee houses that have popped up. And the reason is, is because coffee houses can sell you a cup of coffee for $3.50, $4.50, $5 that only cost them a quarter to make. Think of the profit out there. So it's a huge, huge industry and a huge business. And I get it. I'm a coffee guy. Uh, I have to have my couple cups every single morning. And I used to be somebody that stopped and got one on the way into work. And at one point or another, I said, you know what? I'm spending $350. Some people, a lot of people tell me $350 silly. They spend a lot more than that. But at $350 a day, seven days a week, that's $25 a week just on having a coffee. Plus, you got to sit in that, that line in your car that winds around the, the, the coffee shop to wait your turn to get your coffee through the window. So you got to pay $25 a week for that privilege. If you do that every day of the year, that's over $1,200 spent on coffee that way. Think about that for a second. Nobody's going to give up their coffee every day, but maybe they could cut it back to just a couple of days a week. Uh, my, my office was always big at going out to lunch. So if you go out to lunch, you get a fast food burger, $6.50. Now, of course, if you get fries, if you get a drink with it, uh, if you get a dessert, you're easily 10, 12 bucks now for going out to lunch. But just for that burger, that's $45 a week or over $2,300 a year going out to eat lunch. So again, nobody's going to stop eating out. That, that client that I had isn't going to stop eating out. But if instead of going as often as they do, what if they cut it in half, right? What if they cut, the, cut their coffee expense from $1,200 to $600 a year? What if they cut their, cut their going out to lunch from $2,400 to $1,200 a year? That's $1,800 a year of savings they would have right there. Think for a minute of how pleased you would be if you had an extra $1,800 in your bank account right now. Over 10 years, that's $18,000 on coffee and eating out lunch. Imagine the impact that would have if that money was being steered into your 401k, right? And that's really what this is all about, is finding some money that we can put towards some of our longer-term goals so that we can reach those goals. All of us have vices, uh, it's, and, it's, and it's way too easy, I get it, to pick on people who have a, a cigarette vice. So I'm not trying to offend anybody. I apologize in advance. But a carton of cigarettes at 80 bucks, if you smoked one carton a month, right? That's $960 a year. I don't know why it says 800. I can do math. That's $1,000 a year on cigarettes. And if, and if you've got a strong habit and you have two cartons a month, now you're talking about over $2,000 a year, again, spent on that, whatever that vice is. And again, you can't just give that up overnight. But imagine if you could cut it in half and you cut the lunch in half and you cut the coffee in half, right? Suddenly you've got almost $3,000 a year of money that you didn't have before, an extra $250 a month. It's $30,000 over 10 years. For most of the people who are out there who are younger and saving money, and they have 30 years of work ahead of them, that's $100,000 of money that they could be putting towards their 401k. Think about that for a little bit. Again, everybody has variable expenses out there. Some they can, they can reduce, some you can't but we've got to find a way a budget will sometimes surprise you as to how much you're spending in different places. So what are some different options you can use to scale back expenses, right? One is you can use public transportation. Again, that depends on where you work. If public transportation goes there, if you have fixed times for work, but certainly I could save some money. And if not, maybe you could carpool with some people, especially with the price of gas going up like it is right now, up over 350, pushing towards $4 a gallon it might be time to start thinking about carpooling again. Uh, they talk about downgrading utility bills. I think in the Phoenix area, that's sometimes tough. When it's 120 degrees outside, we've got to have air conditioning, but maybe we could turn it up a degree. Maybe we could turn it up two degrees. Maybe we could turn off some of the lights in the house that we're not using. Uh, we could also take a look at, can we make our cable package smaller, our phone bill smaller? Um, I, I got to the point where our phone bill was $330 a month. It's like, what is going on? What are we spending money on for a phone? I used to have one landline and it cost me like $7 a month. Now the, the phone companies have tricked me into having packages with internet service and, and family plans 
for $300 a month. Maybe I could attend some free events. Maybe I could grind my own coffee. Right now, my wife goes out to Sprouts. She buys the best coffee that they have in there and grinds it. And we have amazing cups of coffee. I still slip out and get my, my, my specialty every once in a while, but it's really made a big difference. We love cooking together at home. If you haven't done it in a while, you might find that you enjoy it. And there's nothing wrong with shopping at discount stores or using coupons. A lot of people give me give me grief because I'll pull out a coupon sometime. But you know, if you're buying a half gallon of ice cream and you're gonna pay five dollars for it and you got a coupon that gives you a dollar off, why not just pay four dollars for the ice cream, right? All of these things can add up. All these little pieces can add up to be a lot over time. So the secret to financial success is getting a budget and learning to live within that budget. That's the secret. That's how people who make it and have lots of extra money made it. It's because they had a budget. One of my most successful clients, I first met them when they were 25, young couple. Uh, since then, they've got a couple of beautiful young daughters who are in their teens. Um, these guys are, have been financially independent since a couple of years after I met them. They never borrowed money once. They always saved money for whatever they were going to buy. And I asked her how she did it. And she said, you know, we had a budget. And we said, if we wanted something, we've got to find a way within our budget to accumulate enough money to buy it. So they found a way. You can find a way too. So what are the key steps to establishing and maintaining your budget? All right. The first thing is you got to identify all the sources of your income and calculate what the take-home dollars is, right? It's not how much you're getting paid as a gross. It's how much you're actually taking home and putting into your bank account. Now, you could do that on a chart like I had up there before that, that you saw, uh, or you could Google your own budget sheet, or you could just make your own up and write it down on a ledger sheet. But you need to know what your take-home money, take-home monthly is. The second thing you need to do is you need to actually track your spending for a minimum of one month. Minimum. I prefer my clients take two months, right? Because sometimes you can have something unexpected happen during a month that could really mess up the numbers. But if you can do it for at least one month, it's going to make a big difference in how you look at your spending habits. So that means if you stop at the QT and you're getting gas in your car, and while it's pumping, you run inside and you get an iced tea for a dollar six, you need to write down not just the gas that you spent today, but the dollar six you spent on that iced tea. And I know people go, come on, a dollar here, three dollars there. It doesn't make that much of a difference. And I'm going to tell you that it does. Remember those numbers I talked about before. Just saving an extra five dollars a day is one hundred and fifty dollars a month. Right. That's eighteen hundred dollars a year. That's eighteen thousand over ten years. It does make a difference. So track it all for one month. Write it all down. And then you're going to be surprised. You're going to take a look at what you spent your money on, and you're going to say, wow, I really want to go on a fantastic vacation five years from now. Yet what's preventing me from doing that is having a QT iced tea every day. Maybe I can cut back. Maybe I can cut back on a coffee. I can reevaluate where I'm spending my money at. Once I've got that all in my head, then I can create a spending plan that I'm comfortable with, right? Not something that's unrealistic, not something where you give somebody all of your income and they pay you every week, like, like, like you give a kid an allowance. That's not a realistic budgeting practice, right? You want something that works for you. And the only way it works for you is if you develop it and understand how you created it. Once you've got those details done, you just have to sit down and say to yourself, I've got to live within this income. I've got to do it. I can't continue to spend outside my needs. I can't continue just to go freely to my credit card. I have to swing this around. I need to start taking some of this extra money that I should have and put it in account. So when an unexpected emergency comes up, I don't have to use my credit card to get it fixed. I'll have cash to take care of it. And if I don't have an unexpected emergency come up, I can put that money towards my financial plan, whether it goes towards, again, college educations, buying homes, travel, retirement, into my 401k. There's so many people out there that have 401ks, 401as, 457 plans, 403b plans. 
you know, they're from all over the place and they're not putting in any money at all. Imagine if they could start putting away just a hundred dollars a month in a tax deferred area like that. It makes such a huge difference over a 30 or 40 year career. You just have to say, this is what I'm going to do. So first thing I would do if I were you guys is I would say, how do I get a budget sheet, right? I need a sheet. I need something that I can work on. So once again, if you don't want to go on Google, because anymore when you go on Google and look something up, the first 20 things on there are all ads. They're all people who want you to buy something from them, right? If you want to bypass that, go to uh, Arizona Capital Management. If you Google Arizona Capital Management, our website comes up and we have all these tools and calculators on there that you're more than welcome to take advantage of. If you don't want to use ours and you're working with another financial professional, reach out to them. I'm sure that they have a, a budget that you can take advantage of too. So get yourself a budget sheet, track how much your income is, track where you're spending for at least 30 days, preferably 60, but at least 30 days. And that means everything. I know sometimes it's embarrassing, but everything. I have a client that lost almost 100 pounds during this uh, pandemic. And I asked her how she did it. And what she said was, I wrote down everything I ate from the moment I got up to the moment I went to bed. If I went and had a cookie, I wrote it down and I calculated the, the calories. Everything I ate, as embarrassing as it was, I wrote it down. And after a while, I started saying, I don't want to add that extra 100 calories. I'm not going to do that. With the budget, it's the same thing. If you write down everything you're spending money on, at some point, you're going to go, you know what? I'm going to... And I'm not going to run in and get that iced tea at the QT. Maybe I won't stop the Dairy Queen on the way home. Whatever it might be, until you start writing it down, you can't decide what the difference is between your wants and your needs. So get the budget sheet, get rolling. Uh, thank you for attending tonight. Uh, we don't have the ability to open up for any questions, but if you do have a question you want to ask, Again, acm.saterrainvestors.com uh, or Arizona Capital Management. That's our website. You can reach us there. If you have a question, reach out to us. We'd be happy to help you out. Again, my name is Bill Stead. Uh, Matt Julian can also help you out. Uh, we, we appreciate you taking the time tonight. Just a couple of